Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Samantha Holloway. I'm a council member of the European Wound Management Association, chair of the UMA Education Committee and Teacher Network. We find ourselves in very challenging times due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In order to help the wound care community, UMA has organised this webinar, which is devoted to a comprehensive overview of the prevention and management of skin injuries related to the use of personal protective equipment. The webinar will be recorded, so you'll be able to watch the video recording on demand. The recording should be available on the UMA website within the next few days. You can request a certificate of attendance, both for the live participation in the webinar and via the on-demand version via the UMA website. Each speaker will speak for 15 minutes and there will also be 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to ask questions. Please type your question in the question box in the panel to the right. I would ask that you type your questions as soon as you have one and include the country you are based in. The speakers will answer as many as they can during the final 15 minutes. Any questions that we have been able, unable to answer during the session will be responded to via the UMA website. I'm pleased to welcome the speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker will be Julie Jordan O'Brien. Julie is an advanced nurse practitioner at the Plastic Surgery Department, Beaumont Hospital in Ireland. She will be followed by Elena Conde Montero, a dermatologist at the Hospital Universitario Infanta Leonor in Spain. Before we start, we'd like to thank Coloplast for supporting this webinar. Coloplast did not have any influence on the content of this webinar. And we'd like to start by showing you a short video that was provided by Coloplast, and it shows some of our Spanish nurses' approach to preventing skin injuries using a dressing. Vamos a enseñaros cómo proteger unas zonas de la cara más propensas a sufrir heridas a causa del actual uso prolongado de los equipos de protección individual. Para ello, utilizaremos una posita hidrocoloide natural tipo Confi, que son resistentes y aguantan todo el turno sin desplazarse ni despegarse. Lo primero que haremos será marcar en el apósito la forma de las zonas a proteger y lo recortaremos dejando los bordes redondeados. Aplicaremos en la piel dando un pequeño masaje para que se caliente y se adhiera mejor y a continuación nos colocaremos nuestro equipo de protección individual, en este caso mascarilla y gafas de protección ocular. Para retirarlo, tras quitarnos nuestro equipo, lo haremos desde una esquina sujetando la piel mientras estiramos el apósito para después ir despegándolo suavemente. Esto es todo, esperamos que os haya gustado y os sirva de ayuda y nada, mucho ánimo a todos. So that was a short video uh, from Coloplast. I'd now like to move to our first speaker. Uh, so thank you, Julie. It's over to you. Thanks, Anne. So thanks, Anne, for inviting me to speak today at this webinar. And thanks to Yuma for organising it, to Natalia especially. And thanks to you guys for joining in. I hope that you can see my screen clearly now. This is a brief session to outline the current evidence-based medical practice on skin damage prevention and management as a result of PPE, your personal protective equipment. For example, your mask, your goggles, your gloves. It provides an overall practical approach for the frontline staff, and I hope that you get some benefit from it. This may seem like a minor irritation to most people, but when you're stuck in a gown, goggles, and mask for four hours at least, with more than an itch or an irritation you cannot scratch or relieve, believe me, it's not so minor. So it's a little bit scary out there in the COVID world at the moment. Every day we are learning new information about it globally. 
the more information we have, the better we're able to cope. So understanding the risk and having the right equipment is key. If you are doing a procedure that involves an aerosolized risk, for example, a tracheostomy, then you need to be prepared. You need to protect yourself, your colleagues, and cross-contamination of other non-COVID-19 patients. You need to have a buddy system where you're able to check over and make sure that you have a seal secured and make sure that your gear does not have any tears or rips in it. See the different masks in the corner here of the video. You can see anything from a surgical face mask up to a PAPOR. It's important that we know how to use this and that we know how to make it work. We know how to get a good seal and that we are sure about what we are doing before we proceed with our task. There are lots of videos on donning and doffing of equipment, so watch and practice. Doffing is where you're most likely to contaminate, so don't be complacent. Fitting your personal protective equipment. I know it's difficult to take time to fit your mask, but as the flight attendants say, please fit your own mask before fitting others. If you get sick and you cannot help anyone else, well then you are out of work and nobody can replace you. We are already short-staffed. Ensuring a good fit, seal and secure. Securing your mask not only to get a seal to prevent um, any injury uh, and make sure that there's no cross-contamination of airborne infection, but also to prevent skin injury across the nasal bridge, the zygomatic region and the forehead as seen in the video. Check your local infection control policy and adhere to it. And for those boys who have beards, you won't get a seal with a beard, so you'll either have to sacrifice it or consider if a hood is available and said in suit up. So these are some terrible pictures of some skin damage that actually occurs. It looks awful, it's really painful. And not only are we damaging the staff image, but it creates a portal for coronavirus directly into the circulation. The mask materials indent and damage the skin. And in combination with moisture, they compromise the skin strength leading to skin tears. This is caused by perspiration and increase in moisture. Long wear time, stressful conditions, heat and continuous friction all play a role in the damage of the epidermal and the subdermal layers. This perspiration can cause itching and erythema and dermatitis, which Elena is going to talk about. And remember not to have them tied too tight either because the pressure can cause more damage to the, the tissues. So when it comes to evidence, there is not a lot of data out there on PPE injury. There's no randomized controlled trials and we don't have any multi centi studies yet. However, in 2006, when SARS uh, was about, there was one study from Singapore and 542 healthcare workers, 97% of them had a PPE injury. 59% had acne, 51% itching and 35% rash. And many complained 73% uh, of dry skin on their gloves. This would lead to a lower work output and absenteeism, and we're already short staffed. So many countries who have encountered this problem have tried to deal with it locally, but some have developed guidelines. But stick to your local policy. The um, Apt Feridas Wound Management Association in Portugal uh, produced a global consensus document pertaining to best practice, and they shared it with Canada, the nurse specialising in wound ostomy and continence. And these are the key um, guidelines, summary of the key recommendations that they provided to uh, help staff on the front line. They're a very practical approach. The first one is about skin protection. And thanks to Paolo Wells uh, from Portugal, who shared his consensus document with the Canadians. So skin protection is the first one. Um, it's very important to moisturize after you wash. Something with a dimethylcane in it will allow for longer um, moisturization. When you're drying the skin, don't uh, rub it, just pat dry. And uh, if you can't get a seal, you, you won't be able to see what you're doing and you won't be able to ensure that you don't get cross-contamination. So make sure your gloves don't get tangled, make sure you're dry before you apply. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So taking your time to do this and protect mm -hmm. yourself will be worth it in the end. It leads to more frustration and perspiration if you don't. B e is, uh, is your PPE appropriate? Make sure that you're choosing the right equipment for the right um, procedure at the right time. Make sure that you apply it and get your buddy to check it and adjust the straps to make sure that you have the right fit. 
and make sure that you're not uncomfortable. I mean, you're not going to last four hours if you're uncomfortable in your um, in your suit and if your mask is not. The use of dressing material is quite controversial. There are some guidelines that recommend that you use a thin hydrocolloid, something that's tapered, something that's going to protect from pressure and, and friction injury. However, there are other guidelines that do not recommend this. If you are going to do, uh, do so, if you're wearing um, a P95 mask, just be careful because you need to ensure that you get a proper seal to make sure that there uh, is no co cross contamination or expiration of air. You can check the seal by securing it around or puffing out to make sure your mask does have a, a, a inflation. So make sure your PPE is uh, fitting you correctly. So pressure relief is fairly uh, standard. We're used to that from pressure ulcer injury. It's recommended that you remove it four hourly. Other, um, other uh, guidelines will say two hourly. However, you should have a team of people to relieve you on a regular basis if you are in PPE for a long time. And if it becomes soiled or wet in any way, you have to remove it and replace it immediately. For skin cleansing and hydration, once the PPE has been removed, the dressing should be removed and inspected, the skin inspection. Hand washing, face drying, and make sure that you don't damage cause the skin. Dry your face and make sure that you have um, a skin barrier if you're going to reapply the PPE. This can be a wand. Um, we use 3M Cavalon here in Ireland, and we find it very efficient, but you must have 90 seconds to have it uh, completely dry before you reapply your PPE. The NHS reiterate a lot of the uh, recommendations, the key recommendations from the um, Canadian guidelines. So ensuring correct fitting is important. Make sure your guidelines are donning and doffing. Make sure you're clean and well and dry 30 minutes before you apply your PPE. And this can be very time consuming. So making sure before you start the shift that you're moisturized properly and that it's dry. It's not going to build up a residue underneath and that you're not going to um, interfere with the seal in any way. And it's not going to run into your eyes when you start to perspire under the mask and that you can actually see what you're doing when you're trying to perform a task. White soft paraffin is flammable, so be careful that you don't smoke around it. It, it could cause a fire, particularly in an oxygenated area. And taking the time to fit your mask and get your body over is important. Uh, staying hydrated throughout the day is really important in nutrition. Um, we don't always have time to take breaks, but uh, ensuring that you do have a team to take over from you will prevent both mental and physical frustration and breakdown. The NHS also talk a, a little bit about um, protecting the skin underneath products uh, that should be chosen should have a tapered edge, uh, thin hydrocolloid or thin foam. Um, low profile as thin as possible and do a fit test. If you're sh not uh, sure whether the fit test is really working, you should uh, remove yourself from the area and clean again your visor and your face and reapply and um, make sure you have a seal before you, you go back in. So if you do happen to get a break in skin, because over the bridge of the nose is very, very thin, um, it is important that you inform your line manager and an incident report is recorded. Um, I'm not sure whether too many people are doing this in their country so far, but it would indeed be uh, very relevant information to have. Um, consider alternative uh, equipment. If you're wearing glasses, you should have a hood instead of goggles. And uh, if you, indeed you do have to put a dressing on, it should be a very thin hydrocolloid as shown in the video. Um, of course, there are other products available and it's up to you to look at your local formula. The WOCN also have released um, guidance and their recommendations say that they do not place a dressing of any type under an N95 mask. And I think people are getting confused about the different types of masks and maybe um, they should practice uh, applying their mask and making sure they get a seal before they place any dressing underneath as there is no evidence to say that it will prevent um, aerialized infection. The MPIP, or National Pressure uh, Injury Advisory Panel, um, position statement on preventing uh, injury in N95 masks also say that wearers should be safe and that indeed uh, they should avoid placing anything underneath it. So um, application of a barrier is recommended, however, um, before uh, placing an N25 on. Petroleum jelly is not recommended as it uh, can cause a slippage underneath the mask and therefore interfere with your seal. 
and um, they make a recommendation of uh, prophylactic dressings under an N95. There is no recommendation for this as it can interfere with the seal. And then they just uh, talk a little bit about uh, not being able to stack multiple dressings on, obviously keep it as thin as possible to get a seal and um, to ensure that the outer layer is non-permeable so that it's not porous and allow for um, infection to get through. The duration of pressure, obviously removing the masks every 15 minutes for two every two hours is important. So regular breaks um, to ensure that the devices don't cause any um, pressure. And treating facial injuries, uh, topical moisturizers, liquid protections are recommended. And for deep tissue injury of three or four, it is recommended that you seek a professional wound care advice. This is uh, the international consensus document um, related to pressure ulcer, the secure prevention. This mnemonic, this document is a comprehensive synthesis of current understanding of etiology of uh, device related pressure injury. And um, this was developed by Professor Geffen and Paolo Alves and his team um, who to look at device related um, injury from things like um, mostly to patients uh, devices used in hospitals. However, they are updating um, a, um, a session for May to deal with masks and PPE uh, directly as well. And this is available free to download from the Journal of Wound Care. And we really liked the uh, secure mnemonic so it's a secure pathway for device-related pressure ulcer prevention. And uh, we integrated it to develop one for um, particularly in relation to uh, PPE injury. And uh, you can go through the secure mnemonic there and um, adapt it for your own um, policies uh, locally. So reducing the risk of PPE on facial injuries um, by combining the principles of safe application fitting and fit test. So secure best get your body to check and secure again. So skin hygiene and moisturization we've talked about, it's very important. Dressings, whether prophylactically in treatment, there is some debate around this. However, uh, barrier creams and, and applicators would be recommended to protect the skin from friction before the application of goggles. Pressure relief obviously is most important. Taking regular breaks should be uh, essential. Education, we need to have education amongst infection control and tissue viability teams and industry to ensure that the products are appropriate and used appropriately for each case. Collaboration between the device, go back, sorry, between the device and skincare product manufacturers to healthcare workers, infection control teams, um, in order to develop international best practice guidelines for everybody. And they should, we all should be singing off the same hymn sheet. Understanding the cause of damage and the correct product to use to avoid skin injury, compromising PPE efficacy and safety. And we have teams of people in Bowman Hospital who go around and give advice on which appropriate PPE uh, staff should be using and whether they have any flaws or any difficulties in using them. We should have some data collection on prevalence of skin injuries for healthcare professionals to ensure that reporting is done in a timely manner and that um, any damages or um, any ill equipment can be identified and eradicated. We need to evaluate the skincare products and we need to all to collaborate with industry to make sure that um, we have the right um, equipment and materials used in developing these uh, PPE. So in really in, um, in summary, um, secure skin care dressings and pressure relief, there are multiple guidelines out there. There are some, some conflict, but I think we would all agree that it's important to shower and moisturize, allow a few hours for the moisturization to happen and your skin to dry properly before you apply any barrier, before you apply any sort of PPE. Alcohol-free barrier wipes are important. 90 seconds to apply once a day is enough. Um, and N N95 masks, make sure that you get a seal. It's a one fit only. You cannot reapply it. You must uh, change your mask regularly and avoid the use of dressings if you can. If you need to use a dressing, well, then you need to use a low profile one. And remember your fist pit test technique, make sure you're donning and doffing, make sure when you're doffing that you don't contaminate yourself and others, wash your hands and use your secure technique. And I think that's it, Sam. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julie. Little technical problems, but I was okay. <laughs> that's okay, don't worry. 
So we, we have some questions coming in, but um, we'll come to those at the end. So thank you for those who have posted questions already. Um, just a reminder for those who are still thinking about questions, please pose your question as you go along and we will come back to that. So now I'd like to hand over to Elena Conde Montero, who's going to give a dermatologist perspective on the topic. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Samantha. And um, well, um, thank you, Yuli. It's always a pleasure uh, meeting you, even if, if it's like this, <laughs> not in person, but um, it's, <laughs> I'm really happy to participate in this really interesting but also very necessary webinar for us healthcare professionals. Um, well, I work in Madrid, and uh, as all of you know, our Spanish health system has collapsed, and especially in Madrid, and my hospital has been one of the most affected ones. And when I start any presentation talking about Gun Helen, I, I like to begin with the picture of my team. These are some of my colleagues. They are excellent nurses, and uh, well, we share the same passion that healing wounds. And this is one year ago, as you can see, it was a windy day when we were having fun here in Madrid. But this was my daily practice, and this was my team. But uh, five weeks ago, uh, everything changed and I started to be part of uh, the internal medicine department and this is a small part of a very big picture, the picture of a whole hospital with all the members, each single person working at the hospital working together with us with a single motto. I would summarize it with three words collaboration, solidarity, and doing our best. And, well, we, we, I've been using uh, PPEs for these five weeks. And in fact, the word says protection, but they will protect us, but we have to protect us from them too, mainly to prevent skin damage. Julie has told us about this study, this Chinese study with more than 500 surveys and a, prevalent, yeah, a prevalence of skin lesions of 97%. And uh, if we go in depth, these uh, problems in healthcare professionals are mainly dryness, tenderness, itching, desquamation, and erythema. And the most affected side is the nasal bridge, and that's because of the overlap of goggles and mask. And another interesting result of this study, and it's something that we see a lot in our clinical daily practice, is that the more time you spend where, with your PP on, you'll have more probabilities of developing skin lesions, so time really counts. Well, here's an, an, an example. This is me, and well, uh, these are some lesions, uh, well, some erythema, some edema, and special sites on my skin. And this was after 30 minutes with uh, all uh, these devices, uh, part of the PPE. So these kind of lesions that uh, are mainly edema or erythema will normally appear um, in short periods of time. But, well, this is a colleague and two hours after Dauphin PPE, and you can see that you know, the lesion is still there, but in two more hours, it will be disappear. It will normally disappear. Yeah. And, uh, well, you can also find uh, some desquamation, mostly in people with previous skin diseases, uh, such as atopic dermatitis, and not only in the face, but also in the hands. And these uh, erythema and uh, scaling, desquamation, can vary. Um, but the risk of having severe lesions will be completely related to the number of hours you have to be with your PP on. This was seen in that study, and this is what we uh, daily see in the hospital. So blisters, erosions, and more deep ulcers may appear 
mainly in those professionals that have to wear these um, equipments for more hours. But uh, well, this is a, um, a good point. Um, most lesions will be superficial um, erosions. This will be um, not uh, deep ulcers uh, that will be uh, at the end chronic wounds, but we will talk about that later. This is something common that we could find as very superficial partial thickness lesions. So, well, Judy has talked a lot about these guidelines, protocols, and so I just want to focus on the dermatological tips. And first of all, I would like to highlight that these lesions are, may impact a lot in our quality of life and uh, our professional activity. So it's really important to prevent them. And uh, we normally talk about facial lesions, but uh, something that's very, very common and uh, it's increasing in, the, in these last weeks are problems with uh, hand dermatitis. Irritant hand dermatitis is a very common disease among healthcare, healthcare professionals. And uh, well, due to continuous hand washing and uh, hydroalcoholic uh, gels and uh, well, the overlap of gloves, so, so these problems are increasing. And um, as I don't want to repeat things, I will just uh, highlight interesting things that may help you from my dermatological point of view. So dressings may be interesting to um, achieve pressure relief in risk area. Okay, but um, even if we use a traumatic dressings, just imagine uh, putting on and removing them uh, several times. Even I repeat, if they are atraumatic, doffing of these um, dressings, especially if you put them with tension, we, we normally try to put them straight there. So um, when we, in the moment of doffing, we can make breaks in the epidermis. This is the, uh, the most superficial layer of the skin. So we have to pay attention to that. And talking about emollients, if anyone is expecting me to tell you the best emollient in the world, the general uh, best uh, product, well, I won't tell you that because this, is, this should be very individualized. And um, the best emollient for you is the one with, with which you feel more hydrated and comfortable. So it's for you to choose. And um, well, as Yuri said, it's very important to keep your skin moisture, but your the necessities of your skin will depend on the of, uh, on the quality of your skin. So this is a, this has to be in individualized. And if emollients are not enough to prevent erythema or desquamation to appear, corticosteroids will be there to help you. And uh, a dermatological tip: if you have uh, problems with your irritant hand dermatitis, um, at night rest, it would be interesting to put a paraffin uh, ointment on your hands and covering it with um, cotton gloves or skin uh, friendly tissues, just to help the ointment to penetrate in the skin and also to provide you with more, more moisturizing. So, before talking about corticosteroids in these irritant dermatitis, I have to tell you that when the cause of the contact dermatitis cannot be avoided, treatments, uh, well, the effectiveness of treatments will vary a lot. So, um, in fact, as I've told you, when every team and this can make this disquamation cannot be avoided with emollients. There we have corticosteroids. And uh, well, as general um, suggestions, for very dry lesions, we will prefer ointments. 
just think about these um, like any five lesions on the hands or and but uh, for instance for facial lesions we will use screens and uh, we will normally use them uh, short term in fa facial lesions well depending on the lesions but for, for some days but in hands for uh, we may need them for weeks so you should contact your dermatologist and uh, they will tell you the best um, treatment for you to continue and uh, the potency well we know we may use mid potency like these ones here or high potency well uh, as i've told you the dermatologist will be there to assess you and we are talking about uh, moisturizing a lot but as julie said um we may have problems also with excess of moisture uh, our face our face is full of glands and uh, sebaceous and sweating glands and they can over be overactivated and uh, occlusion is one of the of the causes of this overactivation and this can be very problematic in our clinical practice so uh, as this has been said fast drying residue free barrier products may be very interesting to prevent lesions from excessive moisture. And if we are talking about um, skin damage secondary to PPEs in people without skin lesions, just imagine those people with previous dermatitis. Uh, this will be much more complicated because they, they will normally worsen. Here you can see some examples. People with uh, seborrheic dermatitis, and these are the typical locations um, between the brows and in the natural lab labial folds. Um, uh, this uh, dermatitis may be more or less uh, scaling or erythematous, as you can see here. So these patients, uh, and we, we are seeing that obviously they, they may worsen. And also uh, people with uh, skin that's uh, prone to acne, uh, they may have outbreaks of these disease and also rosacea. But not only people that had it, but also these outbreaks can be new, new because of uh, PPEs, but also because of stress. And here, this is the lesion on the neck, um, not because of pressure or shear or whatever related to direct contact with a uh, mask or Google or whatever. This is uh, secondary to nervous itching and scratching. This is a uh, nervous dermatitis, and uh, this can be a real problem because uh, it's a vicious cycle and it's difficult to stop uh, scratching and uh, you can have secondary goons here, erosions that can get infected. So, and this is uh, associated to stress. So we have to, uh, to pay attention and to try to help people to deal with stress in order not to uh, have these kinds of lesions that are most frequently found in people with atopic dermatitis or other um, previous dermatological problems. This is um, a skin condition that responds to corticosteroids, but you have to be uh, to continue the treatment. And let's go back to erosions and ulcers. Um, so, as with any wound, the first thing, if you if we want uh, an, uh, a successful treatment, we have to start by a uh, correct diagnosis and etiological treatment. Okay, so here we're talking about lesions secondary to shear, uh, to friction, to pressure. So the first thing to do, as Yuli said, if the problems, uh, if you have problems with your Googles, you may think of a face shield or a hood or whatever, but pre pressure points need to be changed. If, if not, we will make the problem worsen and worsen be worse and worse so um just once said that this is a short reminder of what a clean superficial non-complicated wound is so these wounds are expected to heal in uh, some weeks without problem 
if the cost has been corrected. So now I this is a question for you as health professionals. What would you recommend to manage this acute wound secondary to PPE? Well, first of all, it's clear we have to prevent the cost, so pressure points should be changed. And, uh, but what else? Well, in fact, this is um, a very controversial question because even thinking about cleansing, there's no consensus at all. But you may uh, recommend several things or nothing, but the point is that the unrecommended products, these two here, are very recommended in our clinical practice. So um, we don't really know which one is the best product to use in these cases, but there are lots of uh, products in the market that have components that may help to heal these wounds. These restorative creams may have zinc, that's very interesting to promote epithelialization, or hyaluronic acid, that's also very interesting to promote this keratinocyte migration. <laughs> yeah, this is very fashionable uh, hyaluronic acid nowadays. And I would like to finish with um, a reflection. As in superficial burns, that was, uh, in fact, we, uh, these lesions because of PPEs may be considered abrasions. If we, in burns, we may use corticosteroids to reduce inflammation and to avoid, uh, for, example, for example, hypertrophic scars. Well, um, in, mainly in patients with lots of inflammation um, in the, uh, these uh, wounds, may, for corticosteroids may be an interesting option for some days to reduce this inflammation and to promote healing. Well, this is something that uh, is not evidence-based, but it's, uh, it's nice to have in mind to help our patients. Uh, in fact, now our colleagues are our patients and um, well, this a final message, uh, everything should be in individualized. We should, uh, as uh, Yuli said, we should uh, assess where the problem is, identify it and try to solve it. It's like picking flowers in a garden. It should be very individualized. And well, this is the Spanish, these are the Spanish words to say, please take care. And these are the words that we are using uh, daily uh, with our colleagues. So this is my message for you all, take care. And anything you want to ask or uh, you want to share from your experience will really enrich this present presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Helena, and thank you, Julie. So if I can bring um, Julie back as well, we'll take some questions now. Um, questions have been coming in. The first question is actually in, I think, Spanish. So I am going to try and read it in Spanish. Forgive me for my pronunciation. Thank you, Alejandra, for your question. ¿Por qué no utilizar petrolato posterior al retiro del EP? Does that make sense, Helena, to you in the way I've meant? I, I've understood something related to petrolatum jelly and uh, dolphin, but if you could uh, read it again, may, maybe I will have another, <laughs> but I, I have it more or less. I think that is the question. So why wouldn't you use petrolatum um, under, um, because you said, I think it was Julie, the recommendations are we shouldn't be using petrolatum jelly. Uh, ah, and my understanding okay. is it's because it's flammable and that's the main, it can be a fire hazard. Yes, that, and, and, yeah. and, 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 and um, it's very greasy too, so it's difficult to get rid of it before uh, going and, and putting your, your PPE. So, um, yeah, these are the two main reasons. But at home, you can put on your face the best emollient for you when, not, uh, when you are not uh, before at the point of uh, donning. Uh, so at night rest or whatever, you can use the products that are best for you. So you don't have to think about those uh, disadvantages. 
Thank you. The next question is a quite specific question. It's um, from somebody who's wearing a fluid repellent mask throughout an eight hour day and three weeks ago had a, a small spot on the bridge of the nose and it's not healed since. Um, I think it's healing and then breaking down again. So I think the question is around what should this person be using on their nose when they still have what is an open blister for either of you. Have either of you got any recommendations? If the pressure there or the friction or, or the shear uh, cannot be avoided, this lesion will chronify. And uh, something special uh, for lesions or um, erosions or wounds on the nasal bridge, that this is a very sebaceous area. So when we think about wound healing, we try to think about moisture. But in fact, in this area, uh, Mm, we have to think in another way because there, there's uh, uh, overproduction of uh, sebum. So maybe the problem is, is also that the products used there can, mm, are uh, producing more inflammation because of uh, the absence of control of uh, over sweating and over uh, sebum production. So. Mm, it uh, it should be uh, I mean without a photo given general uh, considerations but mainly inflammation is the main aspect that is chronifying that lesion so if uh, uh, too, uh, uh, the products there that are being used are producing too much moisture there they should be changed uh, think about when uh, corticosteroids for a very short period to control uh, excessive inflammation and first of all uh, avoid pressure friction and think about uh, putting products doffing of these products because uh, if, as, when a wound is healing and it's uh, and if, in fact acute wounds as I've, I've shown you when they develop a scab it's better not to touch anything so <laughs> we don't even know if it better to clean them. So maybe um, this lesion or well, any lesion that's not healing, the problem is that we are putting and uh, removing too much things when they, they, our skin is just wanting to uh, produce more keratinocytes, fibroblasts, and what we are doing is just removing them. So just try to, well, that's my recommendation, avoid pressure, friction, and use products that uh, prevent epidermal, epidermal damage. Okay, thank you. And certainly in the UK, we'd be recommending that you report your injury to, um, to somebody because you probably should not be caring for patients with open wounds to the face, which is, uh, is a risk. Uh, the next question comes from um, Kimberly. I'm not sure where Kimberly is from. Um, it's what is the recommendation for staff with skin allergies uh, should there be testing for equipment allergies? Um, I don't know if Elena or Julie want to take that. Um, in fact, um, skin allergies to PPEs, well, we have to wait for data being published, but not so many have been reported. So it's, it, uh, as far as I know, at this moment, it shouldn't be a general practice to yeah, to do this test, but time will tell, and it's very important to use material uh, with low capacity to produce uh, uh, sensitivity. So, well, but we have to we have to wait. But at, at this time, I, uh, I don't think this is an interesting measure. And Julie, I know you're on the um, the hotline for PPE in Ireland, aren't you? The helpline. Is there anything coming through from Ireland about? Uh, Testing. Yeah, no, that, that is one of my, one of my roles, um, one of my many roles. But um, I did receive some calls about people complaining of rash and dermatitis from the gloves, and they were requesting to be tested. But obviously, there are no uh, testing going on at the moment, particularly in you know skin testing. But we have asked them, Sam, to go to their occupational health department. To yep. report it and to be seen there by our occupational health doctor who will advise them what's the best treatment for it. 
Okay. Well, that moves us to the next question, actually, from Kimberly LeBlanc. Welcome, Kimberly, from Canada. Um, Kimberly's asking about um, prevention management of hand der dermatitis and whether there's any recommendations about what should be used. Um, Elena, do you want to take that question? Uh uh general recommendations when i when you are at home um it's very interesting to keep your hands moist and uh, just to uh, help your skin to uh, recover from the damages to the uh, skin barrier and products um should have components that uh, really help to hydrate the skin and um, so these are the and the ones we call emollients and yellow uh, petrolatum jelly is one of these components that help you to recover your skin barrier and the tip i told i've told you before of um, putting your uh, ointment and afterwards a, a glove uh, a glove will will help you to to improve the penetration of the ointment and the hydrating power of it so this is a very good point yeah clipping with your gloves <laughs> so maybe some cotton cotton type gloves cotton type, type. Yes. there are other skin friendly fabrics that are nice too and if you have chronic dermatitis something interesting too is to use corticosteroids in a preventive manner that means um, instead of waiting to the outbreak, you can use twice a week, three times a week, uh, this uh, emollient mix with corticosteroids so that you can prevent uh, erythema and discrimination from going worse. So that's another tip, mainly for those people with chronic uh, dermatitis. Because in fact, the dermatitis we are seeing are mainly, uh, yeah, I, irritants not allergic both in the hands and, and and face that's why it's not that interesting to to do these tests for allergic things so yeah hand dermatitis is a problem for every single healthcare professional and in these days yeah it's a trending topic <laughs> so um we also have another question from kim and it's another dermatology related uh, question as well you were talking about acne and the exacerbation of acne and uh, uh, masks, Elena. Is there anything you can recommend uh, for the management of acne? So rather than prevention, but management once it has exacerbated. So for people with acne prone skin, even if we are recommending lots of moisturizing or whatever, they have to use special creams for a acne prone skin and if uh, there are also creams that can help to um, to prevent these lesions to from going worse for some cases we we'll need um systemic treatment some oral treatments yes such as tetracycline the short-term tetracycline and other uh, and uh, well, uh, other treatments that the dermatologist will advise. But first of all, cleansing and special creams for acne-prone skin, creams that may help specific treatment. But if not, we have other treatments that may help. And but we are seeing lots of people that well did not have acne or for years and they say oh my god but i'm young again the thing is that stress is also having a, an important role but occlusion it's uh, it's also terrible so there are different products it's interesting to uh, uh, be referred to the dermatologist to choose the best option either topical or systemic Okay, thank you. Well, our last question uh, for this evening, and um, just to say that we will answer other questions that have been posed, we will answer those via the Yuma website because we haven't had time to answer all of them. But last question for Julie, if I can ask, uh, it's a question from uh, Sarah in the UK, is can you just say a little bit more about nutrition and hydration, quite briefly, the importance <laughs> of nutrition and hydration for, for healthcare professionals? 
Um, like Elena has already said, um, like we're all working in a very stressful environment. If you're wearing PPE, you're going to be more dehydrated, you're perspiring more, and you're completely stressed out. So um, it's not always, I know in the real world, it's not always uh, possible to get somebody to relieve you. But if you can get relieved for regular breaks, that's really important to go. Have your water bottle um, nearby at the station um, or outside in the coffee room so that you can get out and have a, a proper drink of water. Nutrition, um, I have to say, we're all comfort eating a little because of the stress. So maybe we're not making the best choices, but let's not beat ourselves up. Let's try and just make sure that we, you know, eat our fruit, eat our vegetables and um, up our fiber and make sure that we get regular breaks in order to stay on top of our nutrition to prevent some of these acne problems that Elena is talking about. Um, but at the same time, enjoy our food and enjoy our breaks and try not to talk about PPE when we are on our breaks so that we can hydrate properly. The problem with hydrating is uh, then we need to go to the bathroom and we don't always have an opportunity to doff to go to the bathroom. So you've got to, you know, you've got to get your timing right. You've got to make sure that you have um People to relieve you, um, I suppose, is the most important thing. And people have been very, very good in the hospital at looking after their comrades and their um, their local um, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals. And uh, we have to look after ourselves and our colleagues at this difficult time. Thank you. I think that's a very nice note to finish on. So I'd like to bring the webinar to a close. I'd like to thank you for posing your questions. And I would like to remind you that we'll be answering all of your questions via the UMA website. So don't forget, you can access the recording on the webinar on demand via the, U <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the UMA webpage. That's www.uma.org. And please follow the link from what we do to webinars. So I'm pleased to announce that the next Yuma webinar on telemedicine and wound management, current practice and future potential will be held on Tuesday the 5th of May, uh, which I'll also be moderating. The speakers of the webinar are the Yuma president, Alberto Piagesi, and the Yuma council member, Luke Tio. Uh, Yuma is planning the next series of webinars already, and those will be on the topic of compression. And those will be delivered by experts, including Alison Hopkins and Christine Moffitt. The first one is planned for the end of May, the exact date of which will be announced on the UMA website and social media platforms, including Twitter. And you can find us via UMA Wound. Thank you again. Uh, stay safe and good night to everybody. Thank you.